Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to today's lunchtime lecture, uh, Conservator Chats, A Peek Inside the Sama Mummy Cat with Dr. Sarah Schillinger and Miss Mimi Levesque. Uh, my name is Stephanie Obar Garcia, and I am the Public Programs Diversity and Inclusion Manager at the San Antonio Museum of Art. Um, thank you to everyone that has joined us today and your continued support of the museum. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll be taking a couple of questions from the audience. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A feature. So you can go ahead and type in your questions um, anytime into there and we'll see them. And then, um, and a special thank you to our donors, uh, lectures and artist conversations are made possible by the generous support from the Lewis A. and Francis B. Wagner Lecture Fund. And with that, I will turn it over to Jessica Powers, who is the interim chief curator. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all for joining us for today's program. This year, the San Antonio Museum of Art is celebrating its 40th anniversary, and we're marking the occasion with our fall exhibition, which is called 40 Years, 40 Stories, Treasures and New Discoveries from Siamas Collection. One of the fascinating works in this exhibition is a mummified cat from ancient Egypt. Today, we're going to hear about the conservation of this cat mummy from, that uh, Dr. Sarah Skellinger and Ms. Mimi Levesque undertook in 2017 and 2018 with the support of a grant from the American Research Center in Egypt. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers this afternoon. Dr. Sarah Skellinger is a visiting fellow and lecturer at The Ohio State University in the departments of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures and History of Art. She is a specialist in the art and archeology span of ancient Egypt and Nubia, and she's currently the co-director of the S. Selim R4 archeological project in the Northern Dongola reach of Northern Sudan. Before joining the faculty at Ohio State, Dr. Skellinger served as the inaugural Andrew W. Mellon Foundation postdoctoral curatorial fellow here at SAMA, and she curated the 2018 exhibition, Egyptian Animal Mummies, Science Explores an Ancient Religion, that looked at all of the museum's collection of animal mummies. Ms. Mimi Levesque is Director of Archaea Technica Con Conservation Services. She is a conservator of objects and textiles with a special interest in archaeological materials, in particular ancient Egyptian artifacts. She has worked for more than 40 years on the examination and conservation of Egyptian mummies and coffins. She has worked as a conservator at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, at the Rhode Island School of Design Museum in Providence, and at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. She's also served as a consultant to Egyptian collections and institution installations for many museums around the US, including the Mummy Collection at the Michael C. Carlos Museum in Atlanta, and consulting on the treatment of the animal mummies here at the San Antonio Museum of Art. Their talk today is called A Peek Inside the Sama Cat Mummy. And Dr. Skellinger and Ms. Levesque, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Jessica and Stephanie, and to the entire Sama community for asking us to come back. We're delighted to continue talking about the cat mummy and the animal mummies as a whole that are all near and dear to our hearts. So today we're talking about the largest category of animal mummies discovered in ancient Egypt, which were votive offerings. These mummies or these animals were born and raised in the temple precincts of the god or goddess to whom they would, to whom they were sacred. Petitioners would go to the temple, purchase a mummy and dedicate it to the god or goddess. The priest would then take the offering and bury it in a nearby catacomb. This practice became quite popular, particularly from the third intermediate period through the Roman period, where millions of animals were raised, sacrificed, and dedicated to various de deities. Here you can see a votive mummy of a dog, now in the British Museum, that probably would have been offered to the god Anubis. This map shows animal mummy cemeteries throughout Egypt. And as you can see, they mummified a range of animals from tiny scarab beetles to larger animals such as rams and baboons. This category of animal mummy is also the group of mummies that we find at the San Antonio Museum of Art. The animal mummies at the museum were gifted and bequeathed by two donors, Gilbert M. Denman Jr., a San Antonio lawyer and philanthropist, and Beryl McCleary, a collector from Houston, Texas, 
who lived in Egypt with her husband and four children from 1963 to 1967. Mr. Denman was an active donor to the museum and was instrumental in establishing the museum's collection of Egyptian, Greek, and Roman art. In 1991, he gifted a collection of crocodile mummies and a cat mummy to the museum. After his death in 2004, the museum received two ibis mummies that Mr. Denman gave to the museum. Mrs. McCleary's husband, Hank, worked in domestic and international petroleum exploration as a geophysicist with Amoco Oil Company. During their time in Egypt in the mid 1960s, the McCleary's purchased the falcon mummies. In 2003, Mrs. McCleary gifted them to the museum. Through a partnership between the museum and the radiology department at University of Texas Health San Antonio, I organized the X-ray imaging and CT scanning analysis of the animal mummies, which occurred on April 2nd, 2017. It was through these tests that what lay underneath the wrappings was revealed. X-ray imaging has been used to study ancient Egyptian animal mummies since the late 1800s and has allowed researchers to examine the contents of the mummies without unwrapping and damaging them. Additionally, CT scanning allows for an enhanced imaging since it provides a three-dimensional rendering of the bones given that the organs were removed. The x-rays were completed first so we could get a quick idea of what was inside and what each mummy contained to determine especially if there were any foreign objects inside since metal can interfere with the CT scans. Here we can see on the top left, um, Dr. Rob Koch of the San, of the San Antonio Zoo um, investigating the cat mummy prior to it being x-rayed. And then you can also see the lead um, technician, Charlie Berry, getting ready to CT scan the various mummies. Um, we had a lovely group from the museum as well as the um, University of Texas Health um, San Antonio Radiology Department, you can see on the bottom of the screen. Uh, the scanning of the mummies was covered by the San Antonio Express News, and we made the front page. This was not only great press for the study of the mummies, but also for the upcoming exhibition as well. I will now hand over the presentation to Mimi to discuss the conservation of the cat mummy. During the 40 years that I've been working with mummies, I've developed guidelines for their ethical conservation treatment. Unlike other objects treated by conservators, mummies were once living beings and therefore it's important to treat them with respect as individuals. While not human, I feel that animal mummies in museum collections should be treated with the same care. Treatment on mummies is intended to stabilize the mummy, to limit further damage, to restore dignity to the mummy. And this can be done by cleaning to remove non-original material such as dust and soot from storage or exhibition, by re-articulating the bones where possible to return the mummy to its original form, Re uh, reattaching detached pieces, reintegrating linens and trappings, trappings like shrouds or cartonars coverings or bead networks, which were often included with mummies in their burial. Maintaining all original materials with the mummy, regardless of how small. Avoid damage due to treatment, <clears throat> due to the treatment methods and materials, as well as to permit further research and intervention to avoid altering or obscuring details of wrapping and mummification, and to ensure that all additions can be completely removed without altering original material. In the past, irreversible adhesives or other harmful materials were used to treat mummies, making them less stable with time and preventing research on materials of mummification now and in the future. I will not be the last person to study or treat any mummy, so I need to make it possible for newer methods in the future to be used. So here's our cat mummy before treatment. You can see him curled into a fragile little ball. As Sarah said, the cat mummy was purchased by Gilbert Denman Jr. and then donated to the museum in 1991 along with the crocodile mummies. But due to his deteriorated state, the cat was classified as quote, unsuitable for display and placed into storage. And it was in pretty sad shape. Just as when treating other types of objects, it's critical for a conservator to have as much information about mummies as possible, to understand the complexity of construction and the potential condition issues before beginning a treatment to avoid damaging fragile materials. 
The information gained by x-rays and CT scans is incredibly helpful, really indispensable when developing a mummy treatment. Scans and x-rays can reveal internal damage that may be obscured by the wrappings and allow the mummy to be examined by the conservator even before touching it. In the case of the cat mummy, the x-ray confirmed the presence of a feline skeleton, but it had suffered extensive damage, especially to the midsection, probably because of the way it was squished up into this compact C-shaped bundle. Some of the upper body remains articulated, but really the skeleton is mostly a jumble of disarticulated bones, including ribs and toes settled down into the bottom end that you can see that's actually curled around onto the top. The instability of the mummy had been exacerbated by an extensive ancient infestation of dermestid beetles that had consumed most of the cat's flesh and some of the fur, allowing for that disarticulation and leaving behind considerable quantities of brass and insect bodies and debris inside the wrappings. The beetles chewed holes in the linens as they escaped as adults, which weakened the structure even further. Based on the x-rays and the extent of the damage that they revealed, it was clear that the curled position of the cat was not original. Rather, the cat mummy was intended to be presented stretched out. So my first task was to straighten it out slowly to be able to examine the wrappings in detail. And here are two steps in the initial opening of the mummy. As suspected, the linens were in terrible condition. The embalmers had wrapped the mummified body of the cat spirally in only two layers of linen strips that originally had overlapped but now they'd become loosened and had separated, creating gaps that had allowed bits of the mummy to fall out. An outer shroud that we, can, we will see more of shortly was fragmentary. It had been made of a more densely woven fabric that must have made the cat into a tight bundle, but when it was complete, the head was had been covered by a short red fabric that was still intact, but it's now bound at the neck by narrow linen straps that appear to have been rewrapped and tied at an unknown date. A clearer picture of the original mummy had begun to emerge. Here's an x-ray of a similarly embalmed cat mummy at the UPenn Museum and the sketches that I made <clears throat> to show the original positions of the inner wrapping layers of our cat. A coarsely woven inner layer, now only fragmentary, was the first layer. That fabric was a well-worn old cloth, even in ancient times, with some old sewn repairs that you can see on the right. It was followed by the short red cloth over the head and then the second wrapped linen layer. For every mummy that I treat, I always document the textiles, recording wrapping patterns, thread counts, and any other interesting features in order to add to our knowledge of mummification. Given the extremely damaged condition of the mummy, it was clear that it would be necessary to create safe inner housings for the disarticulated bones and other remains. Due to time constraints and the amount of losses, it wasn't really possible to rearticulate the skeleton. So Sarah and I determined that the remains of the mummy should be encapsulated in modern linen and then replaced inside the wrappings. Finer dust and debris were then placed in pouches of soft wash Tyvek, which is an archival non-woven polyethylene fabric. And they were placed inside as well to be sure all the original material was preserved. These packets served to create the solid core for the body of the cat, allowing it to be rewrapped in its original form. As the remains were encapsulated, the linens could be cleaned using a micro hose attachment on a variable speed vacuum. And then any original debris was taken from that va vacuum. We used a clean bag when we started and we were able to put those back into the Tybic pouches. So nothing was lost. As the mummy fragments were bagged, the fur color was revealed identifying our cat as an orange tabby. A large proportion of orange tabby cats are male. The tomcat being one of the many manifestations of bra shown, is shown in the Middle Kingdom Magical Knives and in the Book of the Dead fighting the servant Apep. Given his orange fur and tough past, this cat mummy has been affectionately named Oliver after the character in the Disney movie, Oliver and Company. The mummy was then reconstructed. The packets were positioned and the original linens rewound around them. A transparent covering of silk crepe linen that you can see going on in the upper pictures um, was dyed to match with tea so that it would almost disappear when it was on the body. 
It was then sewn from the neck down, as you can see in the slide on the upper right. The bands that had been tied around the neck were untied and removed, and they proved to be narrow strips of linen folded in thirds. It was possible to determine their original positions in the mummy by the visible changes in the linen wrappings. Strips of modern linen were inserted into the folds, allowing the bands to be replaced in their original positions. Where the original bands were lost, we made modern ones out of a nice matched linen color um, because they were critical <clears throat> to the stability of the wrappings. But despite all these reinforcements, the mummy was still not sufficiently stable on its own. In consultation with the curator, we decided to create solid support that would allow safe handling to be as unobtrusive as possible. And so I created a paper mache support covered in linen, much like ancient Egyptian cartonnage. It was secured to the mummy with two linen bands and the treatment was complete. All the material used in the treatment was safe and stable and all can be removed without any damage to the mummy if treatment is, retreatment is ever required. Back to you. Thank you, Mimi. So as she mentioned, during treatment, the fragment of coarse inner outer cover, inner of coarse linen outer covering was revealed to have been the remains of a painted shroud, something extremely rare in animal mummies. Given this find, we performed multispectral, specifically ultraviolet and infrared photography on the shroud to determine if additional traces of paint not visible under regular light could be detected. The UV photography highlighted the red and black pigments forming the diamond pattern on the shroud, showing us that the diamonds were outlined in black and filled in with red, but the circles in the middle of the diamond were not filled in red. In addition to the preserved red and black pigment, there were traces of Egyptian blue on the oblong portions of the shroud. Minute traces of the Egyptian blue, circled in red, were visible to the naked eye. This pattern of tubular beads was designed to mimic a faience bead net dress, which was a common covering for human mummies. The original number of straps and their position are not certain, but there are indentations and abrasions on the painted shroud that indicated that at least some of the bands had been tied horizontally with one vertical band used to secure the mummy, as you can see in the drawing below. Infrared photography confirmed the presence of Egyptian blue on the shroud because the blue pigment fluoresced or glowed, revealing more traces of the pigment than could be seen with the naked eye. As you can see here, all of the areas in the black and white photographs that have areas that are glowing are all spots where the, there is Egyptian blue remaining on the painted shroud. The ancient Egyptians used Egyptian blue, which is the world's oldest synthetic pigment, to color various objects, including stelae, papyri, mummy coffins, and tomb walls. One of the materials used to create Egyptian blue includes copper, and the amount of copper present produced varying hues of blue from light to dark. As mentioned before, the presence of a painted shroud is a rare find on animal mummies, but intricate patterns of the wrappings are actually quite common. You can see a nice diamond pattern on this cat mummy in the Cairo Museum. The design on the shroud can also be found on similar human mummy shrouds, such as this one in the National Museum of Scotland. It similarly has a diamond pattern with a central circle and oblong portions intended to represent faience beads. Due to the similarities between the shrouds, the cat mummy in the San Antonio Museum of Art collection might also date to the Roman period. The results from all of the tests, photography, and conservation were highlighted in an exhibition that I curated titled Egyptian Animal Mummies, Science Explorers and, and Ancient Religion, as Jessica mentioned earlier. It was quite popular among all the, angel, among all the ages. Um, all the mummies were displayed with their x-rays so the visitors would have a chance to see what was inside. And of course, Oliver got a spotlighted wall all to himself. Um, we would like to thank everybody who um, helped us um, to create not only the exhibition, but also all of the research that we did, as none of this is ever possible to be done completely by yourself, but um, is certainly a village to, to um, create this exhibition. Thank you. 
Well, thank you so much, Sarah and Mimi. This is quite a remarkable project and an incredible transformation um, for the cat that was in such bad shape. And I'm so pleased that we were able to do this and we're able to show him again. Um, I wanted to see if there are any uh, questions um, for Sarah and Mimi in the chat. I don't see any um, at the moment. You have a comment that says, I love your calling of Oliver, uh, which is great. Um, and Mimi, one question that I have um, is, I, or their uh, audience might be interested to hear whether you've worked uh, on animal mummies um, apart from this project and, and whether there was anything particular that struck, stood out to you in your experience working on the animal mummies at SAMA. Um, I have worked on quite a number of animal mummies in the past, um, but I have to say your cat was the biggest challenge and I think the most interesting animal mummy I've ever worked on. He's he, every bit about him, and, but particularly the shroud and being able to find out what his fur color was, you know, that's pretty special. Um, I, I think every single mummy I've worked on brings something new, something different, something interesting. And we learn so much every single time. So it's, it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of other questions. So um, Sarah, this is a, a question for you, I think. Um, someone is asking, how was synthetic Egyptian blue, they said Egyptian blue dye, but how was Egyptian blue made? Um, sure, it was actually quite a complex process where they would take the materials, so it was a lime, silica, copper um, mixture, and they would have to um, combine all of the materials into a powder and fire it for a long period of time. And when I say long, I mean about three days at a very um, low temperature. And then it would form these um, chunks of the raw Egyptian blue, which would then be ground down again and refired um, again for extended periods of time, which would then form the fine, refined um, usable bits of Egyptian blue that would then be subsequently ground down yet again and then mixed with an oil or a fat so it was able to be used in a paintable um, form. Or glue. Right. Or glue, yes. Um, I, I did actually replication studies and what she says is absolutely true. Um, my Egyptian blue was terrible. <laughs> 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 I don't envy them the amount of work that they had to put into to make this. Thank you. Um, we also have another question. Uh, someone is asking, is much known about the details of Mr. Denman's acquisition and the overall provenance of the cat mummy slash Oliver. Um, Sarah, do you want to speak to that or would you like me to? Um, I, from what I remember, and please correct me where I'm possibly forgetting, but I know he um, acquired it from a museum auction, auction. I can't remember if it was a Christie's or Sotheby's. Um, but from what I remember, there was not a lot of provenance tied to the cat, unfortunately. It was purchased in um, 1970, and it seems mm -hmm. like it had been in a British collection before that, but, but we weren't able to trace it. Um, and to anyone who's curious about the provenance, um, we do have the cat mummy on our website. Uh, they, um, uh, page uh, dedicated to the collection. So if you can search for the cat mummy there, we have all the provenance information is shared there as well. Right. It's there. Oh. Um, uh, there's some other questions. Okay, in the uh, Q&A. Um, so one, one person is asking, um, when the cat was mummified, was the shroud and painted and then he was wrapped or was he wrapped and then the shroud was painted? Oh, um, the shroud would have been painted separately and then the cat would have been wrapped and it would have been an overlay as kind of a final covering, but it would have been painted separately and then it, um, attached to the cat mummy as opposed to attached and then painted. It's, it's always possible that it was being reused mm -hmm. um, from maybe it was the end of a shroud that was made for a human mummy or something from some other purpose um, that ended up being used funerarily for this cat. 
We also have someone who's asking if other Egyptian animals besides cats and dogs were mummified. Oh yes, um, we have a wide range of animals from tiny little scarab beetles all the way up to donkeys and horses. We even have a pre-dynastic naturally mummified elephant from um, probably from Sudan or what was known as Nubia at the time, but pretty much uh, there, there were few animals that were not eligible to be mummified. All right, and we have another person is asking if we know anything about why the cat was in this position before treatment. Um, I'm guessing not, but I don't know if either of you have a guess about how it got into that kind of U shape. I, my guess when I looked at it was that that was how someone thought they could keep all the insides from falling out because the, the cat had been so badly damaged to begin with by being eaten by insects, which destroyed the integrity of the actual body. Um, and so that was a problem. And then the linen that was the inner layer was very fragile and it was, it was that reused layer that had been mended many times in, the, in antiquity. Um, so it was pretty fragile. And I think that as the, the outer shroud got damaged, it just lost its structure altogether. And someone must have thought, well, if I just squish it all up into a ball, then <laughs> maybe I can keep everything inside. It seems to have worked because you know, nothing more seems to have fallen out particularly. No, and it was such a surprise to see the painted shroud kind of emerge when you started working on, on all the treatment. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, one more question or maybe uh, two, one more question, um, whether there were any videos made uh, about the wrapping techniques or the conservation treatment. Um, I'm not sure that we have any though. I know photos so. were taken, but not videos. Right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, that's the uh, end of our question. So thank you to everyone who's watching uh, the talk today. And thank you both Dr. Scalinger and Ms. Levesque. We really appreciate you joining us today and sharing your work um, with, with Sam and with our audience. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It was fun.